Hi. So I'm a music supervisor at Ology. Uh, how many of you guys uh, have had contact with or experience with music supervisors? Not a lot? All right, cool. I've got uh, blank sheets. I mostly work with films, I've got to admit. I haven't worked uh, with games a lot. I've worked with some games, uh, some licensing and some uh, sourcing right talent for the sort of sound and, and musical style that uh, the couple of games I worked with uh, were after. I'd really love to get more into games. I, I, I play games, I love games. Um, it's a slightly different way of thinking uh, in terms of what the, mu what the purpose of the music is, uh, what the possibilities of the music are. But mostly, I'd say, 80% um, of the mentality in finding and working with music in games uh, is really similar to the uh, process of working with music in films. Or, uh, or in ads, TV series, uh, branding, and, what, uh, and the other projects we do. So today we're going to talk a bit about my process, how, uh, how we work, how, typic how a typical music supervisor approaches a project, what the po possibilities of the music supervision process are. Uh, my intention is not to uh, <laughs> impose the services of music supervisors onto every project you have, but I want you all to um, identify the process of music supervision, uh, and hopefully at the end of the talk you'll feel more curious and inspired to what music can do for your projects. Um, so if I sound like I'm being a douche and pushing myself or Ology, just throw something at me. Um, I'm not going to talk about <laughs> chip tunes and early game music and stuff either, because, uh, two reasons for that, because I presume you guys know more about that stuff than I do, first of all, and second, chip tunes and the early gaming era music, I see that more as a contribution from the gaming world to music, whereas today we're going to talk about more what contribution the world of music can give to games and your narratives and your universes, etc., etc. Uh, do I have a clicker? I'll just push the... So, uh, just very quickly uh, about a music supervision agency. We'll typically be involved in processes rega regarding um, use of music in branding, in communication, in ads, in films, creating music identity, um, executing music production, uh, music events, licensing, apps, um, social media, etc., etc. So m many music supervisors are freelancers and sort of uh, uh, work specializing in games or ads or in films. I'm uh, an ology is more like a group of music supervisors working on a number of uh, touch points uh, and and projects that need music um, to help them somehow. Um, so, um, this is the Wikipedia definition. Uh, I think it's decent, which is why I put it up there. It's a person who combines music and visual media. That's easy. <laughs> uh, supervisor's responsibilities are to locate, secure, and oversee music-related talent. So, um, talent could mean finding a track, a band, or something to sort of push that soundtrack, build that trailer, or uh, finding the talent of uh, some young composer, producer, who makes those beats and atmospheres and whatever you need. And, or maybe help facilitate a production for the game or license it. So, uh, uh, a music supervisor will usually act as a liaison between the creative and business end of the process. So, um, uh, a lot of the times there's going to be a business and legal side to it because the music is um, uh, a complex uh, rights issue as well. Uh, we need to license the, uh, the work and copyright it for, for the game. Um, this is a very specific and a bit tangled, complicated process because the legal side of music is complicated and we're going to come slightly back to that. But um, just to point out that a music supervisor needs to secure all these uh, issues. So uh, it's not enough to have an amazing idea. 
you know, uh, I'm sure a lot of uh, a lot of game trailers would do well with a Kanye beat on it, but you have to make it happen too, <laughs> in terms of uh, licensing it and getting it. And uh, so there needs needs to be a <laughs> a link between a good idea and what 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 we can actually do in terms of the licensing and the um, and the resources that we have. But the game can also be a resource for the music rights holders, so for the band, because the games can, or the film can have an audience or a target group that the band and the music would really like to tap into. And we're going to come, uh, we're going to come back to that too, how we can uh, uh, look for the syncs, uh, the connections, wh where we can create win-win situations where uh, perhaps we sort of minimize the uh, transaction of money because there's, it's good exposure for both game and, and music. Um, so um, I sort of split it up in the creative process, the licensing part of it, and then the business part of it. Maybe it would make more sense um, to talk about the business side of things before licensing. I realized that this morning. That's a fail. <laughs> I would uh, prefer, if I was to prepare this again, to put the licensing part in the end. Because normally you do the creative part, then you do the business part. Can we do this? Can we afford it? What's in it? And then we do the licensing, which is the paper for work and the definition of the rights we have that we grant to the game, etc., etc. Um, right. Um, so you're. you're Mostly game developers in some perspective, right? You're involved with developing games. How many of you have been involved in a process that meant finding music or finding a style? Or how many of you have wondered? Yeah, that's more common, right? And how do you start? Is it just sort of your playlist, uh, what you like, or is it some sort of reference for a game? Or how, how do you start the creative process sort of finding the sound and identity of the game. Any, any ideas? Yeah? Right. Did everyone hear that? We good? Because there's a microphone here as well, right? Uh, the answer, right. So you were saying uh, there's a theme to the game, and um, and you're trying to find sort of attributes, cultural references and attributes of that theme that match the music somehow, and you try to find music that has the same sort of qualities and associations. Uh, great. That's very educated. Uh, anyone else? Yeah. So there's a movie related to the subject matter, and this movie, movie has its own sound, or maybe soundtrack even, or some... Yeah. Sure. And uh, I guess in case where uh, games are being made on, uh, based on some movie, uh, the license is implied, so they're allowed to use all the music that's connected to the film, right? So, so this creative process is more related to, to the game developing that sort of starts from scratch and builds its own universe, uh, because building on something else, it's obviously defined, so you just follow that up. Um, that was a great soundtrack earlier, by the way, on that trailer for Alien. I love that. Uh, yeah, I mean, the first part is uh, defining the purpose, I guess. Um, why, why do we want the music in the in the scene or in the part. What what is it there to create tension or to help uh, build a character? Uh, the first uh, the first sort of uh, usages of music in film it was solely for entertainment purposes. I mean the guy uh, playing the piano uh, in front of the silent movie it was for entertainment and to cover up the mechanical sounds of the film reels. So they uh, got a musician to play the piano and, and the silent movies, and, the, and that's where it started. And I guess you could say about the first games, I mean, the 8-bit uh, sounds as well. It's, it was uh, because the te technical side of the music 
uh, was so limited, you, could, you couldn't have a lot of ambition in terms of sound design and atmosphere and really making impact. So it was mostly entertainment. But uh, you got to really, I, it's a really good uh, question to answer first. What's the purpose of the music? So are we, are we building an atmosphere? Are we helping, um, are we helping the narrative somehow? Uh, if we're in this uh, confusing space, maybe the music needs to sort of guide, uh, um, guide us through or, or give some hints or maybe confuse or maybe building characters. Um, uh, create atmosphere, yeah, dynamics, tension, etc., etc. Um, this there can be a number of different things, but once we've defined the purpose, uh, there's defining the style. So, musical style or cultural or subcultural references. If if it's a game that is based on a theme, we need to match that up. So we need to locate. Uh, right, we're we're we we need music for for tension and dramatics, and we're heavy metal. And if we've come to that point to those two definitions, we've really narrowed down a lot. We're, we've come pretty far, because then it's just about <laughs> um, finding a source and finding something that, that fits the bill and, and matches the, the resources that we have and you know, the licensing and the business part, which we're going to come back to. Um, the style part can be a tricky part there, is that it can be somehow hard to talk about music, and we tend to have our own subjective languages in music. Uh, a music supervisor is often a really important part in understanding the typical language of a certain director or a certain game developer, and being able to sort of uh, translate that into some sort of language that uh, a lot of bands, uh, publishers, labels, music publishers, sorry, uh, and music labels can relate to, so, not, uh, so they can pitch, pitch their music that, uh, and come to the director's preferences. Uh, I'm sure you guys have been involved with, with uh, miscommunications, and, and uh, defi you, you can define music in one way, and that's going to sound completely different, or like the opposite kind of music to the other. And this is the kind of communication issues that the music supervision process is supposed to uh, help help guide in. Um, so, uh, what are your music sources? That's the last part. Um, some some of you have any friends? They play in a band, or they sort of play around with Logic and Live, and they've made some music. Anything like that going on? Yeah. What other sources of music have you guys uh, touched? Just nicked something off YouTube. Yeah. Uh, Royalty-free free music. Royalty music on uh, music production uh, aggregates. So there's a, there are a number of uh, audio network and there's a number of sites that you can go to and they have royalty-free music. You can download it and just apply it. And certain uh, certain common creative rules apply. Right. Good. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So uh, there's a number of uh, the music production uh, software used to be really closed and uh, and unavailable, uh, not intuitive. Uh, Pro Tools. It, it was it, it relied upon five years of uh, university just to be able to open a project and make a couple of tracks. Uh, we we're way past that, and we have even apps for the phones that are really intuitive and inspiring to make music with. Uh, and there's only the issue in that case that some, sometimes you've got to check your license. Because in that small print that you sort of check when you download the app or whatever, some of that <laughs> small print is really relevant to you if you're making a game and you want to publish it. Uh, so through these apps, we can grant license to just play around with it, to make beats and share it with our family. 
but to sync it with a game and publish it and put it out in the out there, uh, it's not necessarily a part of the uh, common license that you grant from buying the app. Um, uh, but yeah, I didn't mean to scare you. It's it, it's mostly okay. <laughs> um, so the licensing, um, if you hear a band or a composer that you really, really like, and you want to see if you can get this music for your game, uh, you got to find out who the rights holders are. So if it's a small band or a small composer, small label, it's just going to be, there's going to be an email address on the SoundCloud page or, or whatever, and you just go ahead, contact them, and tell them about the, your project. But they're going to be interested in uh, a number of things. Um, how much music are you using in terms of length? What songs are you using? Uh, where did you f find it? Because so, they're going to make, make sure that the source you have is, is legit, so it's not something that's bootlegged. Maybe uh, they run the risk of something that's actually not theirs because it's remixed or re-edited by someone else. Uh, so uh, making sure that you actually have the, the music you're talking about and that the copy is, is the relevant one. Um, how much is it... Are you just going to need 12 seconds? Maybe that's an easy sell. But if the whole game is just continuous loops from the same album, you're exposing this band pretty much. So that's a different call. It's, it, it creates a different uh, kind of approach in the negotiating and, and licensing process. Um, how much exposure is this game going to get? So is this a uh, sort of indie, tiny game that's going to be a cult? underground status in some small Norwegian city? Or is this something that's going to be on everyone's Facebook feed worldwide for two years? Um, this is relevant for the licensing people, because if the exposure is great but not relevant for them, then that's just the driving the price of the license up. Then you just got to, that's going to make the license expensive. If the exposure is huge but really relevant to them, in terms that that's a market or a group of people they really want to tap into, because it's relevant for their band, maybe that's a negotiating argument for you guys. Um, and lastly, what kind of exposure? So if it's a kind of exposure that really, really uh, fits the target group of, of, of this band or this music, they're going to be really into collaborating with you. But if it's putting uh, the metal guys into this opposite sort of universe that makes fun of them, or maybe it's a little bit more touchy. You see where I'm going. Like if, if, you, if you're exposing them in the right way, that sort of builds the identity and the, and the uh, image of the, of the band and the music, you have an easier job than if you're portraying them in a way that's comic or absurd or, or whatever. Um. So uh, all these issues got to be uh, defined and put into a paperwork that makes sure you have, you have the rights you need to use this music in your game. Um, um, does anyone know the difference between a composition and a recording? So. That, yep, uh, that's kind of there. So I, I would say the composition is the, it's, it's the idea. It's the actual idea of the music, of the notes and words. Uh, so that's the intellectual property. That's the composition. And then there's the recording. That's the actual production of it. So you may write a song. Um, it's an awesome song. Uh, you copyright protected it, and I'm a musician and producer, so I take your song and I record it in the studio. I pay a drummer, I pay an engineer, and we record it in the studio. And you're a game developer, and you'd really like to use his song and my recording. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> the way music uh, rights work is that you're going to have to clear this 
with both of us. And we don't even have to know each other. We don't even, even have to be friends. We don't even need to uh, um, know of each other. But uh, there's a party that uh, clears and manages the composition rights. Those are typically the music publishers. And then there are parties that uh, handle music recording. So typically music labels. Um, most of the time, when working with indie, indie stuff and small stuff, both sides, so both recording and composition, are going to be controlled by the band themselves. Uh, indie artists that own and control their own rights, they're going to be both composer, songwriter, and producer and master owner. Um, but it's an important distinction, because even when dealing with them in the licensing process, we need to make sure that we have an ag agreement that secures both, both sides. Uh, that's the dull part, but it's got to be said. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about the business side because it's hard and not very interesting. But basically, if you have an amazing product, an amazing game, amazing graphics or visuals, and you find this track that's perfect, and uh, it's not a big band, but you really, you really see a lot of benefits for this band to be in this game, and vice versa. You could, you could argue, it's not sure that the band's going to agree, but you could argue that this exposure and this uh, usage of their music in your game is really interesting for them as well. Um, and so there's a cost in terms of music rights holders are used to being paid for usage of their music. But that payment can be um, money, and sometimes it has to be money because it's regulated by uh, collecting rights societies, and uh, in certain cases there's an exact amount of kroner per sekund, etc., etc. Um, but sometimes it can also be right. So there's this young band in Bergen, they're amazing, and then there's this game in Bergen, and they're amazing. They know each other. They really have shared aesthetics and purpose and narrative. So these guys gave their song to the game, and these, this game, they credited them, and they sort of boost each other's Facebook posts, etc., etc. So this has become more than a sync, where you sync a song in your game. This has become a brand relationship between the band and the game and you guys help each other in terms of PR and marketing. Um, this is uh, why I referenced that making the most of it. Um, if you actually want Kanye in your game, you just have to get a bunch of money and get in touch with a music supervisor. There's no point of wasting more money on, <laughs> wasting more time on that. Um, there is complex and hard sort of clearing processes in, in getting the big songs, the big tracks for the projects. And uh, it's a matter of knowing who the labels are, who the publishers are. If you're aiming that big, go professional. Before that, uh, use your friends and your networks and the bands you listen to. Just make sure you license it right and you have a paperwork. I'm sure um, there are communities um, uh, that could help you uh, with sort of standard framework, paperwork that you guys could use and adapt to. Uh, and if not, I can help you guys at uh, console uh, by making stuff like that, because that's, that could be a valuable resource. Um, so that's a bit business and licensing. Uh, I'm going to show a couple of... Uh, a couple of films uh, we did. Mm, they're not really new or anything. I just, I just thought they were interesting cases in, th in terms of how we uh, thought about the music usage in them. Um, this is an ad for a Norwegian candy uh, manufacturer, Nidar. And it's an animation ad done by a company called Animations uh, I could just quickly play it. Most of you have seen it.
Drøv nyheten nidar favorit. Yeah, the part's not very interesting. We'll come back to that. So, um, what's interesting about that previous ad is that uh, we had as an inspiration all the Walt Disney stuff, and they didn't have a separate sound design process. So, and we didn't really have money for a separate sound design process, so uh, we had to make the sound design with the orchestra, the one day with the small orchestra that we had. So, uh, as well as uh, making the music shift to the different parts of this m magic factory, uh, the music and the arrangement done by the composer is actually sound designing the movements as well. Um, this is an old-school approach which uh, we don't see a lot anymore because in a lot of games now there's, there's, this, there's the sound design which really takes up a lot of the energy in the, in the audio and then music is sort of just there in the background. Uh, I like that project because it was the other way around and as a music supervisor you had uh, a bigger role, which was great. Um, Yeah, uh, I've seen some games, especially smaller games now and apps, which sort of tend to go in the same direction. Uh, and it's not only a creative decision, it might also be a pragmatic thing, because, like I said, you're merging the sound design process, which is normally a separate sort of studio, a separate way of thinking, if you have a playful universe that could fit it, of course. Uh, it's a fun way of going I'm going on sound designing the game through, through music or through the mind of the composer or through the sounds of the orchestra or the musicians or whatever. Uh, most of you have seen this ad probably. En gang til. En gang til, bare en gang til. En siste gang. Please! Bare en gang til. Setting fire to our insides for fun. Collecting names of forever missing them. But I'm forever missing him. En gang til. Så skal jeg ikke mase med deg. Ja, han er kjøt. Ehm... Another ad, like I said, I wish I had more cases from games, but uh, I didn't. <laughs> uh, what was interesting in this case is that... Uh, has anyone heard this band? Yeah, Daughter. They were kind of proper hyped in, uh, two years ago. Uh, but we picked them up really early, uh, and um, uh, we didn't have the budget that uh, could really afford uh, hyped bands from the UK. But uh, we picked them up early and the film was beautiful. So my argument was, you got to see this, it's, it's, it's really nice. It's going to give you a lot of really nice uh, exposure. So it got uh, 1.5 million views and I don't know how many awards and uh, and uh, mentions and articles in uh, the different creative work uh, for us. And they got a r pretty big boost in launching their album uh, from this. And they sold out two or three shows in Oslo every time they came. I mean, they had more momentum than that. It's never enough just having one. It's not because of the ad, of course. But it certainly helped. Um, so it was hard for them to negotiate up the license fee uh, uh, once they saw that the value and potential of the exposure was really nice. Uh, second, um, it's creatively really interesting because it's one of those, why does it fit? It doesn't really. The lyrics don't fit. The style, you wouldn't define the style. I mean, this is typical Norwegian. National Romantics, I mean, why, why would you put some dark, moody, British, minimal indie on that? Sometimes you don't go with logics, you got to go with your gut. Uh, which is why it's an important case for me as well. 
uh, it wasn't a, a product of some sort of qualified analysis from our end, and then there's the, uh, these are the values of the brand, and then there's the filmatic references in this way of editing and casting, and, and then there's the, I mean, you could do that, it's one approach, but sometimes you just gotta go, I really like this song I heard on this blog yesterday, and you put it on and you start working. And for us, it was editing, and for you guys, it could be developing, you know. It's something, something happens when you listen to music and work, and maybe that link is, is your final soundtrack. Um, so that was a really quick and a bit messy um, talk about all the aspects of the music supervision process. Um, I'd really like you guys to get some questions to make this a bit more relevant for you because now it was just like everything. Uh, if we could narrow it down to some cases on particular questions or issues that you've had regarding music or usage of music in your work. Yes. I have a question. I've heard a little bit about uh, sync before. And uh, from my understanding of it, the sync person usually has a very good uh, catalog with his, in, with his, within his domain, like you know. Li and uh, often I see, especially early game development, may have a hard time finding like a focus group, like who, who are your audience? You have to define them like, I'm making this game for everyone. You have to find out who you're making this game for. And I was like, would. How would it function if you like if you if if we make the game, you play test the game, you find out that we are aiming for girls an age thirty five to forty five and we're launching the game globally. Could we like come to you and then you could sort of oh okay, so uh, in these spaces in the game we could uh, like in the introduction scene or in the menus or in certain places where it doesn't disturb the sound design, we could add these artists and it would help fit the target audience and it could also be on the YouTube videos and things like that. Could you uh, explain a bit more how that process would work? Of course. So um, there are some of these uh, slides that we normally talk about that's more corporate oriented where we talk about the branding aspect and how to use music in branding. And even though that word sounds a little off, it's what you're kind of talking about, right? So we need to define our tar target audience, and the question is how can we use music to reach them better? And again, this is about identifying situations in the game or in, in the universe that have a natural space for music, and then just asking the question, what, uh, who are we aiming at? What kind of people are they? What kind of preferences do they have? Uh, and what kind of music do they listen to? Uh, maybe, it's, maybe you have to put the kind of song there that they're actually listening to, or maybe you have to put the songs there that they say they listen to. Uh, this is a part of the music identity process that really varies from project to project, how big is it and how it relates. But it's about defining, um, defining the target audience, their attributes, their preferences, then defining their musical preferences, and then just simply finding those, uh, those bands, and uh, finding those songs, and then starting the classic. So it's kind of a pre-process before the, this music supervision process. You define the target audience, you find the scope of that sound, genres, bands, etc., and then you go ahead and find the uh, spots for it in the game. And it could be in the game, in the films, in the scenes, or it could be in the trailers, in the teasers, in the promotion uh, videos uh, for whatever product we're working with. Um, or it could even be a, a community thing on social media, like if you you can amplify a, a collaboration with an artist. So if, you, if, you, if there's a certain... I, I, I heard a case last time I was here about this Bergen game work, uh, game from Bergen that worked really closely with a band. I think you told me about it. Re really closely with a certain band. So then, it, uh, so then it's about getting 
uh, you know, just talking about it, uh, who is this band and what are their preferences? And Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that was a really good case because they they used each other's. It sounded like me. I I didn't. Uh, I don't know much detail about the project, but it sounded to me like they used each other's uh, uh, associations to help each other and build each other up. They sort of combined their target audiences because they were pretty similar, and then they both used the music in the film, but they also talked about it in a way that sort of amplified the collaboration. Um, but yeah, uh, it's a part of the music supervision process. Music, building music identities. I hope that somewhat answered your question. More questions? Please, questions. No. Yeah. There we go. Uh, I, uh, I am a student, and I worked with. Uh, I'm a game design student, and I worked with a game uh, or a music class. Uh, they made music for our game project in school. Cool. Um, but and obviously, for most of the time, we were pretty on the same page when it came to what type of music we wanted. Yeah. But sometimes it's hard to kind of, you know, we as game developers want something, and they as artists or musicians, they want something else. How do you kind of find a middle ground and and kind of work with artists that has you know a strong opinion about you know what they what they want to make and how they see the vision of the game or whatever that's a great question we struggle sometimes with you know getting yeah, I understand together. that it's it's a really it's a part of uh, it's a big part of what I do um, and it's a great question so how they're gonna want to pull in different directions because they have their artistic musical um, ambition, which is not necessarily related to the needs of the game, so the dramatic needs of the game or the image needs of the game, etc., uh, etc. Et How do you solve that? Uh, you don't. It's messed up. <laughs> now, um, I think the most important thing that uh, we try to do to avoid situations like that is to try to source talent right. So if you get so if you define your purpose first, and then you put that in the brief, right, we need music for this, then you've got to be really strict on who you've got to collaborate with. So they've got to show you that this is what they can do for you. And then you go and collaborate. Sometimes you're not in that position where you can define what you need and just go and wait for it to appear. Uh, we've got to be flexible. All of, our, all of us have to be flexible. Um, and I think, I think it's a great question because it's a hard question. Um, I think a lot of it, it's about communication and expectation management. So if you go into collaboration with a band and you promise them artistic freedom, and then they feel later that they're actually just making, making cues for some sort of arcade universe which is really rigid and not exciting because they make doom metal and they want to make 20 minute long crescendos, um, then you've, you've both just miscommunicated. Um, uh, if, but you're in a situation where you're given partners in your class and you just have to collaborate. And in that case, uh, that's just a creative space negotiation thing, right? In this scene, we've got to do this. It's really important that we do this. Uh, in this scene, maybe it's a little more open, free, right? And then just split it up, split the process up. Um, or just uh, workshop association. So what do we need uh, the, the music to do in this scene? And then you just workshop some associations, just agree on some terms that you all agree upon, and then do a little short process maybe of mood boarding uh, or referencing. So find the reference that you all agree on, uh, match those associations, and then we find that the probability of, uh, 
of a creative fight is, is uh, much lower because at least you've talked about it. You've, you've defined some sort of framework, for creative framework for what the music needs to do and what do we mean by hard. It's simple things like that. You know, it, it needs to be heavy. But this is heavy. No, that's not heavy. And that's a fight you could have avoided if you just discussed the week earlier. So this is a heavy song, do you agree? No, I think this is a heavy song. And then you sort of identify the problem before instead of in the middle of the process. I, that's, yeah, great question. <laughs> uh, yes? Uh, one thing that I found really confusing is like, um, it might be slightly besides the point, but uh, for example with Tono, uh, yeah. When when would you have to pay them, and when would you, for example, <laughs> not? Could I could I, for example, have uh, direct direct contact with an artist and then not pay the tono thing? Um, I really wish I could have a simple answer to that. I would either be lying or oversimplifying. Um, every uh, first of all, not every composer is a member of Tono. Does anybody know what Tono is? Uh, kind of. So Tono is a collecting rights uh, society. Uh, m most, compo most composers and songwriters in Norway are a member of Tono, which means they've uh, given Tono the right to collect money and, and protect certain rights you have in music uh, through copyright laws. So Tono is, for certain music usages, you don't negotiate directly with the composers. Tono has just decided, well, if you use NRK, if you use a Norwegian song for a pre-roll of a show, you have to pay X amount of kroners per episode. Or uh, if you sync Norwegian music to TV drama, you have to pay X kroners per second. Um, and this is a common problem at early stages because there's a collaboration between some young filmmaker and a young uh, game developer with some friend of theirs as a composer, and they've made an agreement. So you're going to give us the music, and we're going to give you the, uh, the whatever, and it's a handshake, and it's done. And then they get some sort of uh, uh, invoice from Tono, and we go, hold on, we've, uh, uh, we have an agreement. Uh, but not all young composers are fully aware of <laughs> the, how the system works as well, because they don't have the right to grant all the rights uh, over to you. Some of the rights, Tono, by becoming a member, you've given them uh, uh, the, what's the word, fullmakt, uh, to dispose and uh, take care of these rights. Uh, authority, thank you. Um, this, is, this is depending on if you're, this is going to be different from if you're actually uh, if you've put music to moving image, it's a synchronization. And for most game purposes, that's going to be up to the composer and the developer to decide. But if you put the game out in a public space, like if the game is playable on a website that's open, or if it's an uh, app that's available for download, you've put the music out in a public space, and there's going to be Tono uh, performing royalty fees. And the performing royalty fees are really low, but I've had a lot of cases where some simple game was uh, made and there was really few resources in producing this game. And so some music was put in and, and they gave the composer or the band 500 kroner or, and thank you. Uh, and then this game goes viral big and gets 300,000 downloads and then they get a mechanization or a performing uh, invoice from Tono, which is huge. Um, uh, of course, in a lot of the cases, they didn't have a licensing agreement. A lot of this, these shocks could be prevented by having a professional uh, license agreement beforehand, just in case your game goes huge or, or in case your composer friend gets signed by some huge major uh, music publisher, and then they start going back in every project they've participated in and going, 
oh, these guys use uh, music, let's follow up on them, see how they're doing. Oh, you've sold your game to Finland, well, et cetera, et cetera. You want to avoid those situations. Um, when, to, when you have to deal with Tono and not is a really complicated question depending on if, if the music is actually downloaded to the phone or is, is it streamed? Is it made available in public? Is it, is it somehow behind a paywall? All these factors are going to uh, change the way Tono look at it. So some information is available on the website. They are uh, open to uh, questions. They're supposed to answer users, because you're users of music. They're supposed to service you guys to make the Norwegian music available for you. Uh, um, but also, sometimes, music supervisors are uh, responsible for this process, dealing with Tono, because it can be tricky, hard, slow, um, and you just lose the momentum and inspiration for what you're doing. I mean, you're not supposed to fight with Tono when you're making a game. That's my perspective, anyway. It's not what you guys are good at, it's what I'm good at. <laughs> and it's not even that fun. It's bureaucracy. But um, in seriousness, there's, there, on the Tono website, Tono, there's a couple of articles, and, uh, and they're constantly changing and making the website easier. So you and and uh, you could just see there, but you can't avoid Tono by handshaking a composer. I think that's got to be a rule of thumb here. It depends. Sorry. Uh, are we out of time? All right, Eleven minutes. Right. A few more. Yeah. What does Tono stand for? Ooh. Tone. Actually, I'm going to Google that. It's <laughs> a great question. I think it's not a forkortelse. <laughs> I think it's not a forkortelse. I think it's a... What does Tono stand for? Does anyone know? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it was uh, when it was made. It was called Norsk Komponistforenings Internationale Musikbyrå Tono. Yeah. I guess they didn't think that was catchy enough. Tono. Something with a tone, musical tone, tono, catchy name. I'm sorry, <laughs> it's an interesting question. Alex, Alex, I'm gonna have to check up on that. But there's a Swedish version of tono, which is called stim, and there's a British version of tono called PRS, uh, Performing Rights Society. I know that one. Uh, in the US, uh, it's not a monopoly. They have several, and there's competition between them. So you have ASCAP and CSAC and uh, BMI. And um, and that's another thing that's complicated because your world in principle is global, right? You don't, I mean, c borders are not very relevant once you make a game and upload it. But these systems are very much tied to national laws or EU laws. So what applies in Norway doesn't necessarily have to apply in France. So what do you do then when you have a game that's really big in Norway and France? Um, if I make a game in Norway, and uh, I use, uh, I go into an agreement with someone from, like, say, England or America. Uh, does that count on their their laws or our laws? Well, that depends on what. That's up to you and an agreement. If uh, if I um, if I was to advise you. I'd say that you have to make an agreement where the last point of that agreement is that uh, the licensing is uh, based upon Norwegian law and that any twists uh, should be decided in, uh, in, in, uh, by the Norwegian definitions and Norwegian law in the Norwegian court. Uh, that's a matter of uh, negotiation and uh, very rarely is anyone going to want to uh, uh, 
object to that. And I'd say it's very common to have to apply the laws uh, in the home producer home uh, nation country. Um, yeah, once I had an artist uh, um, really object that we were we uh, proposed Norwegian law, and they wanted to uh, propose uh, the American law in the agreement, and then that just made everyone nervous. <laughs> so, yeah. You're talking about the composition rights. I mean, uh, it's slightly different with recording rights and music, but that's right. You can't sell your composition rights. I was you saying you can't. You can't. They can never be. No, no, but this is um, so you can define if any twists on disagreements in uh, in the licensing agreement if they are. Uh, misinterpreted or if any sort of beefs appear that they are to be uh, uh, analyzed and and uh, and handled in in the Norwegian court by Norwegian standards that's what you're saying right you still got to apply the Norwegian uh, copyright law on Sveiksloven which is a mess which is a different story uh, but but and, but I, I understand Studio Comet as well that as a composer you can never give away your rights as a composer to that composition, but you can license them, and you can in all practical means make that license open so it it's valid for eternity in all media known and all media that might appear in the future. Uh, so you're practically as a game developer you have all the rights you need for my composition. If, if the agreement defines that, then that's the reality. Yes. Oh, sorry. I, it's so dark in the back, I didn't mean to ignore you. Uh -huh. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, it's more of a tonal question, really, because... Um, their powers are, yeah, let's call them powerful in Norway. Yeah. Um, let's say I go the cheap route and find Creative Commons stuff on uh, the net. Yep. Um, do you still have to pay performing artists things on their tono? Uh, the performing royalties if the Creative Commons is used. Um, I'm 99% sure that that depends on whether the composer of the Creative Commons is Norwegian and whether the composer is a Tono member. Uh, so if there's a Creative Commons license from um, uh, that's not a Tono member and not a member of a PRO, so performing rights uh, organization of some sort, Tono, or the ones we mentioned. Um, they might... Um, tono is not a part of it, but if they're a Tono member, they might still be. And for a more specific answer to your case, I'd really like you to email me, because uh, there might be other factors that play into this as well. Again, no clear answers. Sorry, guys. Any more in the back? Because there's a guy in the front here. We good? Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So um, we did some research here, and uh, apparently Tono stands for Norske Tonediktere, just with the syllables uh, reversed. Yeah, yeah, that's what I thought. It was a sort of yeah, Norske Tonediktere. Thank you. Great Sounds word. a bit better than Noto, maybe. Yeah, yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so, what do you call that when it's not actually an acronym, but you just take bits and pieces from what it's supposed to say and just mix them up to a catchy word? Does that have a name? I no. Don't think so. I, I think you just say that you switch the syllables around. 
Yeah, they switched the syllables around, made a catchy name. Well, at least we learned something in this session. Uh, more questions? Yes, there's one in the front here. Microphone's dead. Hello? Hey. Okay, so um, I'm pretty sure that we're all on a tight budget here. Yeah. At Me too. Which, <laughs> at which point, like, how big do you need to be, or what type of project does it need to be for someone to, to consider bringing you in and that actually being a better solution than not spending the money? I'm really glad you asked that question. Um, I think most music supervisors are really... Uh, uh, we all got to survive and we, got, we all have a need to have a business aspect to what we do and we got to invoice. But without uh, integrity or creative stimul or, or growing uh, in terms of network and the kind of projects we do uh, being challenged by complex rights questions, games and tonal and downloads, or creatively. Uh, for me, games are really interesting because although very similar to their usage of music to film, film music is linear, and it's always going to be linear, and it's always going to be storytelling, and it's going to be one storytelling, whereas games they open, they sort of mess that perspective up. They can be circular, it's, it's interactive, and all that has a lot of potential that's not yet been released in terms of music. So for me, and a lot of colleagues I, I work with internationally in LA, in New York, in Stockholm, um, we love a project that's going to make us grow somehow. So um, I work from no fees to ridiculous fee based on uh, how much energy, time, and effort the project is, and based on what it gives me uh, uh, in terms of how much I grow as a music supervisor. And, and so I'd, I'd, encourage, um, I'd encourage you guys to sell your projects into all the talent that you might, that you have the slightest uh, um, uh, feeling that could help your project or make your project grow better. Just sell it in, and uh, I think you'll be surprised by the amount of music supervisors that are going to be um, really interested in helping you. Uh, at least the good ones, the ones with integrity. And then s <laughs> some are going to be really busy, and some are going to have... Sometimes we have a little less time for small projects, though. Sometimes there's more time for it. And, but, but as a principle, uh, there's no project too small. And I think that's the answer most music supervisors, uh, colleagues of mine, uh, are going to give you. Uh, and, and also, sorry, I'm just going to add to that, the payment model of music supervisors vary a lot. Some have uh, uh, particular fees that, or, you know, per day or per hour or, or whatever. Uh, but in some cases, you're just going to say, well, fine, we have a music budget, which is this. And that's what I have, so you take this and make the most out of it. And then we go, fine, well, I'm going to try to keep 20%, and sometimes you manage that, and sometimes you spend more than you got, but it, it was amazing. <laughs> and we were happy with that. Yeah, I hope that was... Oop, that's awkward. Um, Hello? Yeah. yeah. That's time, right? Okay, yeah, that's time. Thank yeah. you, Goran, that was wonderful. Thank you.